Welcome back to another episode of Muckler Playground. Today, I'm going to be making isopropyl chloride. This is a classic SN1 reaction, or first order nucleophilic substitution reaction. Now, the way this works is that the reaction rate is dependent only on the amount of reactant, or the molecule being transformed. So, in this case, the alcohol. The alcohol is being protonated by the sulfuric acid to make water, which is a great leaving group. And this leaves a bare carbocation. The chloride anion, which is part of in solution with the salt, attacks the carbocation to make isopropyl chloride. Isopropyl chloride is useful for aerine chemistry. It can make phenols, catechols, and hydroquinones through the Hawk process, and it can also be used to make propofol, a short-acting anesthetic. But today, I'm just going to show you how to make isopropyl chloride, an al a secondary alcohol halide. The materials you need are isopropyl alcohol, sodium chloride, muriatic acid, and sulfuric acid. The first thing we're going to do is add in 300 grams of sodium chloride salt. This is a little more than 5 moles of sodium chloride. Now I'm going to pour in 300 milliliters of 91% isopropyl alcohol. This equates to roughly 4 moles of alcohol. Now I'm going to pour in 200 milliliters of muriatic acid. Not only does this provide extra hydrogen chloride, but with the water content in it, it also provides a buffer so all the hydrogen chloride doesn't escape when I add the sulfuric acid. Lastly, I'm going to add 300 milliliters of sulfuric acid. With our distillation system set up, the only thing we need to do now is heat it up. 30 minutes later, you can clearly see that our reaction flask is starting to boil. There's even some condensation on the distillation head. So we're going to put in our ice and our ice packs. This will help our distillate condense better. Just a minute after putting in that ice and those ice packs, you can clearly see some distillate dropping. Now, I'm not sure if this is water, alcohol, or isopropyl chloride, but time will tell soon enough on whether or not we're getting product. Five hours later, let's see how our reaction flask looks. As you can clearly see, there is a buildup of sodium bisulfate and sodium sulfate all around the flask, and this is because the sodium chloride reacted with the sulfuric acid to make this salt. Also, our reaction flask has been boiling less because we've already expelled a lot of the isopropyl alcohol and turned it into isopropyl chloride, but I still believe there's more left in there. In our collecting flask, we have two distinct layers. I suspect that the top one is isopropyl chloride, and the bottom one is a mixture of water, unreacted alcohol, and some muriatic acid. Still, this is nowhere near even a 50% yield, so I'm going to turn the heat up to see if I can get more isopropyl chloride. At 300 degrees, you can clearly see that our solution is boiling again. Let's see if we're getting more product or we're getting byproduct. As you can clearly see, we're getting more byproducts rather than isopropyl chloride. That means we have gotten the most isopropyl chloride we can get from this reaction. So I'm going to turn off the distillation and begin processing it. The first step of processing is separating our aqueous layer from our product. So we're just going to pour this guy out and see how much we have. There's even some hydrogen chloride stored in the solution. I'm not sure if you can see the fumes. As you can see, we have two kind of similar layers, but they're different because one is the aqueous layer and the other is the isopropyl chloride layer. The first thing we got to do is drain off the aqueous layer. Okay, getting near the end point. Okay. Now, the aqueous layer is full of really a lot of acid and some uh, unreacted uh, alcohol. But we're just going to dispose of this and then we're going to further neutralize any acid that's contained in our isopropyl chloride. The next thing I'm going to do is pour in some cold water. Because it's cold, it's going to absorb any extra hydrogen chloride that is dissolved in the solution. Shake it up a little bit. And we're going to put it back on and drain. Now we 
going to drain off our isopropyl chloride and see how much we've been yielded. And if we turn it around and look, you can see we have a little more than 120 milliliters, but we're not done yet. I'm going to put in my drying agent just to get rid of the excess water. And I'm going to keep it there for around five to 10 minutes, just to make sure all that excess water is out of there. After 10 minutes, our solution is fully dry, but we're not done purifying it yet. We still need to do one last distillation that way, any diisopropyl ether, which would be our side product, that's left in there would not be in our final product. Because isopropyl chloride's boiling point is around 34 C, boiling it at a higher temperature allows it to become vapor. However, it won't boil off the diisopropyl ether, which is a side product of our previous reaction, because that boils at around 68 C. Also, you can see that our distillate is boiling at 34 degrees. This indicates we're boiling pure isopropyl chloride. Now we're going to weigh out our distillate. As you can see, we're just shy of 100 milliliters. We have 85.5 grams of isopropyl chloride. Now, it's hard to see the tick marks, but they're between the 99 and the 98 mark. So if we use the value in between, we come out with approximately 0.86 grams per milliliter. That means we have isopropyl chloride because in literature, its density is 0.86 grams per milliliter. Another way to test the presence of isopropyl chloride is to burn it. It will often give off a lot of fumes. Let's see. As you get a lot of soot is being released. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell so you never miss another episode.